I remember a couple of times people have asked me, when will you know that you've made it? And that's when the company was like at 30 million and 40 million. That's Sherry Stewart Deutschman, serial entrepreneur, speaker, and author of Lunch with Lucy, maximize your profits by investing in your people. You know, my response there is when you stop describing me as a female business owner and just as a successful entrepreneur. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Sherry to discuss her key findings about maximizing business growth through employee engagement, including the details of a revolutionary profit-sharing program. What you mean is that because your salary is like five times higher than Frank, our receptionist, that your part of the profit should be five times higher than Frank, the receptionist. He said, yes, exactly. And so I had to let him go. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Sherry Stewart Deutschman built a $40 million company that was named to the Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing private companies in America for 10 straight years. And she did it by putting her people first. But where did Sherry come from and how did she get to where she is today? There's nothing in my origin story to indicate that I would be where I am right now. Um, I was uh, born into a family of Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, in the mountains of North Carolina. So uh, very sheltered in numerous ways. And uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't typically encourage an education outside of high school. So I didn't go to college. I only went to high school. And I got married uh, at 18 because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do often and um, had, you know, no uh, formal training of any kind. And so the only work that I could do in those early years was menial tasks. So I uh, cleaned houses for the wealthy people who had homes in my mountain uh, resort town. And I even had a route where my sister and I cleaned a gas station bathrooms. Definitely not a very glamorous business, pretty gross. But, and you know, we charged $5 a stall to run in, scrub the stall down top to bottom, run to the next stall, run back out, run to the next gas station. It was crazy. Maybe today in these these times we'd get $20 a stall. I don't know. But I um, moved to Nashville, Tennessee, divorced my husband at a very early age and was a single mom. So a single mom with no education, no assets, no money, no nothing, and moved to Nashville, Tennessee because I thought that I was a singer. You know, population 250 in my hometown, I was considered the best singer there. So I moved to Nashville to pursue a career in music And uh, since I only had cleaning and being a Jehovah's Witness in my background, I went to uh, a Lincoln Mercury dealership here to get my first job selling cars. Coincidentally, the only asset that I had was a Volkswagen Rabbit diesel with 200,000 miles on her. I bought her for a dollar. And a lot of people say I got ripped off, but uh, she was like the ugliest car you've ever seen. Big holes everywhere. She had rolled off a mountain and then someone stole the stereo and the speakers out of it. So knowing how bad my car looked, I went to the Lincoln Mercury dealership first to get a a job selling cars there. And um, the general manager came out and said, your timing is really good. We need some saleswomen and we've never had one. So uh, tell me, what do you know about cars? And I said, I, I, yeah, I just don't know very much at all about cars. And he said, well, what do you drive? And I pointed out the window to my beat up old Volkswagen Rabbit. And he just shook his head and said, uh, you know, I don't know about this. This is a very tough business. Can you handle rejection? And I said, yes, sir, I can. And he said, how do I know you can handle rejection? And I said, because I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness knocking on doors since I was in third grade. So he, he laughed out loud and said, great, you got the job. But promise me never to park that piece of shit car on this lot ever again. 
So um, I parked it just at the back of uh, the property and about five days into it, he said, please go pick out a demo. I can't stand to see that car here. Six days later, I had a nice new bright, shiny Mercury Lynx to drive and had to sell my VW to uh, get rid of her. She was so bad I couldn't sell her. I actually had to pay $150 to get rid of her. And that's why people say I got ripped off when I paid a dollar for her. So um, the first couple of years in Nashville were very tough. I was a single mom. I had no support system in town. I didn't know anyone here in Nashville. And so when times got tough and I didn't have enough money to make ends meet, uh, my daughter and I learned to live without electricity sometimes. So I could pay daycare or I could pay the light bill, but not both. So we went without. There was, you know, a time that my parents came by to visit. Well, they didn't come by to visit. They drove five hours to see me. They couldn't call because I didn't have a telephone. So they just showed up and were just aghast that I did not have uh, electricity and that all I had was a cooler over in the kitchen that held my daughter's milk and cheese and <laughs> basics like that. I just told them we were fine. We just had to, you know, make adjustments. And I told them to look at us. You know, we we are totally healthy. We are fine. I think they left me about two hundred dollars before they drove back to North Carolina. But those early years, you know, being a single mom in a strange town, really uh, set me up. I think to be a lot more empathetic leader later when I became a leader, so that I cared a lot more about the personal situation of the employees, and that's largely because. Oftentimes, I would be sitting there working for this company and not being able to concentrate on work because I was literally counting pennies to buy gas to go in my tank to get home to go into a hot apartment because I didn't have AC. You, you mentioned in the book, Lunch with Lucy, so much of this is about investing in your people. And so much of this is about, you know, just that level of empathy that you have there. But did you ever have like any like formal business education? Like, did you ever know that that was like the right way to, to grow a scale of business? Or did you just feel it was the right thing to do? <laughs> no, I didn't know anything about business really. But I read a lot. And I had read the book Nuts about Herb Kelleher and how he started Southwest Airlines. And he believed that if he just took great care of the pilots and the flight attendants and the admin people, that they would be happy at work. And when they were happy at work, then the passengers would be happy at work. And that would make a strong airline. He was right. I mean, even to this day, Southwest Airlines has one of the most uh, fabulous stories and promote so many profitable years because he took that approach. And that really resonated with me. I thought that's smart. And it's just common sense. Now, you say it's common sense to you, but why is it that so many business leaders struggle with that this type of concept? Because obviously, as, as you've grown your businesses, it's been very much based around like transparency and actually investing in people and in, in sharing in the profits. But it seems that most businesses across America are generally very averse to that. It's just fear, fear and greed. I mean, they're afraid that anything that they give to the employees takes food out of their mouths. And it's just the opposite. I've often told people that my company wasn't successful in spite of all the crazy things that I did to take care of my employees. It was only successful because of those things. And, you know, I, I try to get in entrepreneurs to think about taking care of their employees as an investment, not an expense. It's an investment that will actually and absolutely produce the greatest ROI of any investment you'll make on your business. Now, could you speak to some of the, I guess in quotes, some of the crazy things that it, you did and, and how you supported your people? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we paid a fair living wage and I could talk forever about that. I'm really passionate about what that means. Then we helped our employees buy their first home with a gift toward the down payment or closing cost on their first home. We paid for 100% of their medical, dental, disability, and life insurance. And this was before Obamacare. We let all the employees bring their kids and their pets to work. And that proved to be an incredible benefit because a single parent, well, any parent, if your kid has a runny nose, they're not allowed to go to daycare. 
which means you can't go to work. And so the company suffers and you suffer because you're not making any money that day. So in those circumstances or in those rare snow days that we got in Nashville or sometimes uh, tornado days, I just said, bring the kids to work. We'll all pitch in. We'll take care of them. And that turned out to be a great benefit for lots of reasons. If an employee wanted to start their own business, if they had an entrepreneurial drive, then we would help them start their business by investing in the business and moving them from job to job within the company so they knew the different facets of running a business. And I knew how important that was for me because I learned pretty quickly how to make money, but I didn't know how to read a P&L. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet. I didn't know anything about that side of the business. So we helped employees that wanted to start their own businesses learn from that standpoint. And then I think, uh, oh, we paid people by the mile if they would walk or bike to work. So trying to get people to be, you know, more use public transportation. We paid if they took the bus to work, we paid for that because we wanted people to start thinking about that more. And then the, the most popular benefit which we had, which was uh, the game changer, was our profit share, which was, I believe, the single best business idea I ever had in my life. The business Sherry founded specialized in turning raw data from healthcare systems into parsed, understandable bills for patients. And while profit sharing is controversial in many industries, Sherry's method may be even more so. Lots of companies have profit share programs, especially, you know, the big public companies have profit share. But the way they do that is they distribute the profits at the first of the year after the books have closed for the previous year. And they do it based on a percentage of your salary. So the higher your salary, the bigger chunk of the profit you're going to get. And it's not really attached to anything. It's just here, we made some profit. Here's your profit share check. My profit share was very different in that, one, it was done monthly. So every month we gather all the employees together in one room and we went over the financials from the previous month. And we talked about why we had made the amount of profit we had made. So if everybody had done everything that they were supposed to do, that would be reflected in the bottom line. And we could celebrate that. And in months where the profit wasn't as great, then we knew why. And we could talk about it because it had only happened in the last 30, 45 days. So we we could remember and talk about it and learn from it. And it informed behavior. So the important thing was that we did the profit share monthly. And this is the kicker. This is the big difference. It was split evenly. So the CFO got exactly the same dollar amount that our custodian got. And the director of IT, running an uh, an IT team of 22 people, got exactly the same thing our receptionist got. And that told everybody that they were just as important as every other person in the company and no more important than anybody else in the company. And it made them have more empathy and respect for one another and the contribution that the others were making And it really informed their behavioral changes so that they could drive that bottom line up so that every month the profit share checks would get bigger and bigger. And they did, Michael. I mean, the the first profit share checks we distributed were $7. And the last check that I signed before I left the company was almost $1,500. So even in those years when it was just three or $400 a month, that was a huge bonus to somebody that was making $20, $22 an hour to get that extra chunk of change at the end of the month to go toward their debt or the student loans. And it made everybody act differently and work together in a different way. And then importantly, with our profit share, it was a physical check so that I could look each person in the eye and hand them a check and say, look, look at what we did together. And the, the pride that I could see on the faces of the employees, knowing that they were valued as the same as everyone else and that they personally contributed to that number was astonishing. Now, Sherry, there's a lot to unpack here because I, and I, I want to address the skeptic. There's going to be somebody who's listening that's going to say, well, Sherry, that worked for you, but it won't work for me or my law firm. Or they'll look at a lot of the benefits and say, well, those benefits are great, but how could I possibly afford to offer benefits like that? I don't have the resources. What, what would you say to that person? I would say the sooner you start giving your employees skin in the game, 
the sooner you'll be able to afford that and everything else you want to do. Because it really is an investment. And I wish that you could see me now and not just hear me because I would love to show you that you're you're investing just 10 percent you know, of a, of a pie that because of that investment makes the pie huge. It makes it possible for you to do so many other things for yourself and for them. And there's so many, not just in the profit share, but in general, there are so many case studies nationwide, big companies and small that have employee centric cultures and the numbers, the financial results of those companies speak for themselves. I think one of the most fabulous examples is Scripps Healthcare in San Diego. I mean, look it up. Their turnaround, they they were really in trouble financially. And they had a huge problem with keeping nurses on staff. And because California has a very strict ratio of nursing staff to patient, they were constantly in danger of being shut down because they couldn't keep nurses. So they got a new CEO who said, let's do a let's do a survey and see what the employee satisfaction is. And he found out that only 26% of the employees thought that was a good place to work. So he said, let's focus on our employees for a change. And the turnaround that they made over a one year period is something for the history books. It is huge. I can't remember the exact figures at the moment, but it was astronomical. Everybody should look it up. And it was simply because he said, I've got to make sure that the employees are happy if I want to have happy patients and help patients get well. And uh, from that point forward, they've been in like the best places to work in the United States for years since then. And I imagine, so when people hear that this $40 million number and they hear about the perks and the benefits and the profit share, they say, well, I imagine it would be easy to do that, you know, with a $40 million debt-free organization. But I believe you actually rolled out these perks and benefits right from the onset. I did. Now, some of them developed, like the perk to help you buy a house. That was later on. The bring the kids thing was later on. It just became a necessity. But we started out with the profit share program, the fair living wage, paying for 100% of the insurance. Those were all things that were core and what we did from day one. Were there any perks that you guys had, had rolled out that backfired or perhaps didn't work? Yeah, occasionally, you know, we we built a gym. I mean, we had a little gym and then we got a new employee so who said, that's not a gym, that's a geriatric playground. And uh, he was a um, CrossFit trainer, a certified CrossFit guy. And so he had us build out a CrossFit gym. And man, everybody was all over it for a couple of months. And you know how, what happened. After a while, hardly anybody was using that gym. And so we wasted our money. So I wouldn't do that again. You know, in the early days, we just paid for everybody's gym membership. And um, I'd be happy to do that again. But building out a gym that's not used was not very smart. And people told me going in that it w- was not smart and I didn't listen to them. Well, you know, they, uh, they say that there's a, there's a good way to find out if someone does CrossFit and it's, they'll always tell you, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if they're vegan and if they are uh, into yoga. That's right. That's right. So when we talk about the profit sharing, because I know this is this has been something obviously very, very unique that you'd rolled out. Were there ever any situations where you had either more senior team members that you know, perhaps responded? Were there any kind of resentment that they would see identical payouts as somebody who had just started with the company? Not so much resentment, but I had a new employee once who came in as the, you know, the head of the finance department, a very well educated, very smart young man. And after about six weeks with the company, he pulled me aside to tell me that he really appreciated my generosity and uh, my naivete, but I didn't really understand how profit share programs were supposed to work. So I said, well, you know, explain it to me then. And he did. And so I said, oh, oh, I get it. You know, what you mean is that because your salary is like five times higher than Frank, our receptionist, that your part of the profit should be five times higher than Frank, the receptionist. He said, yes, exactly. And so I had to let him go shortly thereafter because it was obvious that he didn't really buy into our culture and that he really did think that he was better than other employees. And he wasn't. And the rest of the time, I, I I didn't get resentment. You know, unlike a lot of people say, well, you didn't include the salespeople in this, did you? We did. Because I wanted the salespeople, even though they were the, the, the most highly paid people in the company, they made more money than I did. I wanted them to see the effects of selling the right accounts at the right price 
and the effect that had on their coworkers, and I wanted them to be able to celebrate alongside them. So you might think that check that they would get, you know, maybe $700 was just a drop in the bucket to them because they were making four or $500,000 a year, but it wasn't. They were right there with us celebrating as loudly as everyone else, and nobody resented them because they knew that they were responsible for that top line that kept growing and growing that enabled us to to lasso the bottom line and make it start growing just as quick as the top line. This level of financial transparency might be alarming to many business owners, but Sherry argues that it's the very thing that your staff needs to hear to ensure greater buy-in. I asked her why she believes that to be the case. We all want our employees to help us make the company more profitable, but unless they know how the company makes money, they're not equipped to make better decisions to make it make more money. So I wanted them to understand, you know, what money we were spending on their behalf and what things really cost. So we did share the financials with them every month. And for most employees, it was just a high level view of the P&L. And I think that was really important for them to see how much we were paying for insurance for, on their behalf and to be totally transparent there. So the only thing we didn't share was um, the salaries. We didn't share that with everybody, but it was especially valuable to my sales team. They weren't happy with just seeing the P&L. They wanted to drive into the penny on the cost of goods. And I let them. In fact, I just invited them into my office and said, pull up a chair. Here's NetSuite, our accounting system, have at it. And let them print off anything they wanted to print off. So they were better informed. and. It made them not bring me crap accounts because they knew where our profits were being made. So I, I don't think anything bad can come from sharing the financials with employees. I've had people say, well, if I do that, then they'll see how much money I'm making and they'll be resentful. No, nah. <laughs> they think you're making a ton of money. They don't understand how much rent costs and how much insurance is and how much the how much you pay for IT support. They have no idea. And they think you're making a lot more money than you are. And so by sharing the financials with them openly, you'll see that they'll have a little bit of empathy for you and realizing, wow, I know you charge $250 an hour, but so little of that goes to the bottom line because of all these expenses that they haven't considered. I can say absolutely positively that none of my employees resented the money that I was making. You know, part of that is because I went without a raise for seven years and they knew it. And then when I finally gave myself a raise, I announced it to them. I gave myself a raise and this is how much I'm paying myself. And they celebrated and hooped and hollered. You know, I bought myself a new car once and they, they celebrated my new car as much as they would have celebrated their own because they knew that I had their backs and that I was enabling them to improve their lives too. And, and also for full clarity, I mean, because you, know, you, you roll out these incredible perks and the incredible benefits and the profit share, but at the same time, there was still, as you've explained, an expectation that people would perform and that they would do their job and that ultimately, even though you kind of led with the, you know, a lot of these perks first, there were people ultimately that if they did not operate in alignment with the values of the organization, wouldn't be there very long. Oh, no. They had to be gone. You know, if we, and, and that was a really cool part of the culture, it made everybody, because of the profit share, it made them only want the best, the cream of the crop working next to them. So when we got new people, they jumped in to help them get up to speed as quick as possible because they wanted them pulling their weight. And so in that way, it really affected behavior. And Sherry, I mean, looking big picture, how, how do you define success? I think uh, success is being able to go to bed at night with a clear conscience, knowing that you've done the best you can do for people around you. And then if you're talking about on, on a financial basis or anything like that, I remember a couple of times people have asked me, when will you know that you've made it? And that's when the company was like it. 30 million and 40 million. And as a woman business owner, when will you know that you've made it? And, you know, my response there is when you stop describing me as a female business owner and just as a successful entrepreneur. So we got to get to get to Lucy. You know, we've got the, the book with the name Lunch with Lucy. Who is Lucy? 
And what, you know, let's talk, what were the lunches? Okay, so I'm Lucy. Lucy is my alter ego. And I created this program to just listen to employees. And I didn't think it sounded that inviting to say, have lunch with the CEO. So I just created this alter ego, Lucy. I like alliteration. So it was Letter, Logic, Lunch, Lucy. <laughs> Letter, Logic was the name of my company. And on Wednesdays, I reserved my lunch hour for an employee. And they would sign up to have lunch with me. They always chose the restaurant. And they chose whoever else might be with us at the table. And then we just talked about what they wanted to talk about. So, you know, sometimes it was an employee wanted me to uh, meet a spouse or somebody they were thinking about making a spouse. One young man, you know, wanted me to have lunch with his mom. And it turned out to be dinner with him and his mom and eight other people and a really hefty bar tab that night. But it was just an, an opportunity for me to learn about them. And so in general, I learned, you know, about unique challenges that they faced before they even came into work every morning or the kind of household they were going to at night. And I learned about their hopes and dreams and what they wanted to be doing with their life that they couldn't do yet because they were just doing all they could do to keep the lights on. And I learned about things that were going on in my company that I wouldn't have known about otherwise. And I was able to respond and make the company better because of that. And I learned what they thought of me as a leader. I mean, they challenged me sometimes, uh, challenged my decisions. Sometimes they used it as an opportunity to tell me about a piece of equipment that was faulty or that was, you know, really becoming a bottleneck in the organization or about some new piece of equipment they'd heard about that they thought we should invest in. And I listened. And they knew that I listened because they saw me take action based on what I heard. And also every week we published the minutes to our leadership meeting for all the employees to read. And if they had talked to me about a faulty piece of equipment, they knew I listened because they could see that at the very next leadership meeting, I discussed it and we decided what to do. And so that gave them confidence and that made more employees want to have lunch with Lucy because they saw it as a way to, you know, get things fixed and to, um, to be heard. It turned out to be the most valuable time I spent in my company every week. There was no replacement for that. And even now, I sold the company in 2016. I have employees who call Lucy to say, can Lucy meet me for lunch or for coffee? Or And the text that I get almost daily or email from somebody, it's Lucy to them. And I think it was a really great way to take down the hierarchical barriers Interesting. My husband has a real estate practice. He has had 350 agents. He sold it last year, but he copied me and he called his duck out with Deutschman and let people sign up to take a walk with him. And he found it similarly to be just transformational and giving people a chance to get to know you, but more importantly, you getting to know them and hearing them. And that makes people feel so valued that you would take the time to listen and hear their life story and hear about their challenges and their dreams, I think everybody should try it. You'll feel so good about yourself and you'll learn things that will save you a lot of time and money. And I remember you mentioned this actually, that you could you could spend tens of thousands of dollars on, on consultants to essentially gauge the effectiveness of your leadership and evaluate your company culture, or you can spend $40 on lunch. Exactly. Yes. So, so let me ask you then, in, in terms of just overall your experience as a business leader, what do you believe sets apart the, the great business leaders from everybody else? Empathy. Absolutely. The ability to put yourself in the shoes of the people who work for you or your clients, to be able to see the world through their lens, through their circumstances. And that will help you make better decisions for the employees and for the customers. And so I, I think empathy is a, the most undervalued trait in leadership these days. After empathy, I think authenticity. And I, I think authenticity, that idea is kind of overused right now. But just being real with people 
and removing all of the the masks and the you know the what people think of us and letting them know who we really are and getting to see who they really are. You know, I had a, a mentor once who advised me to stop telling people that I didn't have a college education, and she said they don't need to know that, and I want you to quit doing it. And I tried that for a while, and I felt that my value telling other entrepreneurs or other wannabe entrepreneurs, don't let a lack of education hold you back. Look at what I've done without it provided a lot more value to the world. And it, it broke down barriers before they could even start. And speaking of barriers, there's going to be people who listen to this and they're going to hear everything and they're going to hear about everything from, from listening to the transparency, to sharing, to investing in your team. And they'll nod along, but they won't do any of it, right? What do you think is the biggest barrier that holds back a business leader from either putting these things in place or really buying into this concept? Fear and greed. And, you know, it is so short-sighted because taking care of the people that the people on the front line that are running your business, taking care of them, there can be no negative consequences for that. I mean, there is no downside to taking good care of people. Just being able to put yourself in their shoes and think, what kind of life would I have if I were paid what they are paid? Or if I had the benefits that I'm providing them, could I live on that? Is that a great way to live? And could I really focus? And would I give a damn about my boss and my boss's company? And the answer is going to be no. And that is proven right now with uh, every year Gallup does a study on employee engagement. And right now they're saying that 64% of our employees are disengaged. And you know why they're disengaged? Because they don't believe they matter. And in most cases, they don't matter. And so when you let employees know that you they do matter, you care and that you want to hear what they have to say and you want to act on what they've told you, then they're going to get in the game and they're going to help you build a much stronger company. There is nothing to fear. You've only you're only going to lose out if you don't try this approach. And, and Sherry, looking back just through your experience with uh, with your organization, what percentage of that, you know, let's say growth rate and that success do you believe is attributable to just, let's say, having the right product or service versus the, you know, let's say the right leadership versus the right team versus really this, this aspect of investing in your team? Like how much of it do you think actually impacted the growth of the business? It's huge. So we were in a mature market, highly commoditized and we're able to be not just to grow quick enough to be on the Inc. 5000 list for 10 straight years, but to be the most expensive in the nation and to still grow at that rate. And it, it was my job to meet with prospective clients and tell them to their faces that you must know that I don't believe the customer comes first. I mean, who does that? Tells the customer to their face, you don't come first. But we did it. I did it. And then I said, you know, my employees will always come first. And let me explain to you what I do for them. Now, let me explain to you how that is going to translate when it comes to the service you're going to get from us. And I didn't even need to tell them anymore. They got it. They started nodding. So our sales team said that 85% of their sales were what they called culture sales, where the customer chose us because of the culture and didn't mind that we were the most expensive in the nation. They knew they were getting a quality product and it, it enabled us to have a, just a, a stellar reputation in the industry. And I imagine that also extended to support a lot of the recruiting as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, everybody wanted to come to work for us. And we're, you know, relatively small company. When I sold the company at 40 million, there were just 52 employees. Uh, they were cream of the crop employees. Now, I don't know how much of this you're, you're able to speak on or maybe want to speak on, but what happened after you sold the company? Because it seemed like a lot of these principles and values that you had instilled in it during your time there weren't essentially, it didn't stay with the organization after you left. I sold the company to private equity in 2016. I was very naive. I didn't really understand. I didn't understand that private equity is not really interested in building a great company. They're interested in creating a great return on the investment for their investors. That's it. 
And so they came in just enamored of our culture and our reputation. And the first day that it was their company, it was an all cash deal. So I, they, I told the employees on a Monday and the following Monday was my last day with them. And the first day that I was not around, they did away with the profit share. And yeah, that added, you know, 10% to the bottom line immediately. But now we, here we are four years later, and I think only 11 or 12 of those original employees are still with them. And the majority left right after that because the culture changed so dramatically. So here we had a highly trained, highly incentivized, highly engaged employees who left because suddenly it was just like every other company where you're just a cog in the wheel and not really seen as a human being who contributed to that uh, success of the company. Heartbreaking. Looking back, I mean, just any regrets? Uh, you know, of course, Re you know, regrets. And then, you know, I got out at the right time. Probably our company had gone through an 18 month history where we quadrupled EBITDA. Uh, it was amazing. And so it was the time for us to get the highest multiple. And, uh, you know, I went for that. And, and at the same time, I had inherited my granddaughter to raise a teenager. So I needed to be there and to be, you know, more available to her. And so, you know, sometimes I wish that I had stayed in the game and continued to grow that business. And, you know, I think by now we'd probably be at, you know, a couple hundred million. And we were just kind of it to the stage of printing money. We were very profitable at that point. So it would have been fun to continue that. Well, and, and if you actually you could speak to this, that the next business you actually founded was, was Brain Trust. If, if you could speak to what that is. Sure. Brain Trust is a peer to peer membership for women owned businesses to help them get to a million in revenue. Probably a lot of the listeners are familiar with EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization. And this is similar to that except that it's for women only and it's for people to help them get to the million dollars so they can join EO. So there are 13 million women businesses, women owned businesses in the U S and less than 2% of them ever get to a million. Only 5% of male owned businesses get to a million. So through this peer to peer interaction, the women help each other, hold each other accountable, help each other over overcome obstacles so that they can hit that, you know, coveted benchmark and uh, establish some financial independence and more influence in the community. And then about a year later, so it was actually, I believe it was this year in, in 2020, you released the book, Lunch with Lucy. Why write the book? Heck, every time, uh, you know, I did a lot of speaking and every time I did, you know, somebody would stand up at the Q&A part and say, you've got to write a book, you know, because there were a lot of obstacles, you know, uh, and lots of interesting stories along the way, you know, bringing in an investor and getting the company ready to sell. You know, I felt like I should. And I knew that our path was very different. This employee centric business model, I don't think has ever had ever been tried on this scale of making it all just about the employees. So I think it's it was worthy of a book. And now having worked with numerous businesses, do you believe that anyone's business is truly different, that they wouldn't benefit from this type of employee centric approach? No, I think every business of every size can benefit. I think where you would have to tweak the model, especially on the profit share, is instead of the net profit per month, perhaps it's on the net profit per job or per project, or in some businesses that are very seasonal, it might be on a um, percentage of the trailing 12 months profitability. And so the profit being done in arrears, uh, maybe even a year in arrears, but still something to make sure the employees have skin in the game. I'll have to say it a million times, there is no better investment. There's no better ROI ever than investing in your employees this way. And Sherry, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? It means changing the way business has been done always. Business that you know benefits mostly white men and business that keeps the wealth in the top 1%. It means changing the game so that other people can actually play and have a chance to benefit. 
I want to give a huge thank you to Sherry Stewart Deutschman for taking this time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Sherry mentioned that the sooner you start giving your employees skin in the game, the sooner you'll be able to afford everything else that you want to do. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Sherry Stewart Deutschman, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be speaking to Jay Kelly, managing partner of Elk and Elk, about building a beloved brand that stands the test of time and what it means to carry on a legacy at a firm once the torch is passed to you. People blew up our social media and our phone lines wondering what happened to Dave to the point where we actually had to put out on social media, no, this is our transition. Dave is fine, kind of a proof of life photo of Dave. So people knew, you know, we had not like rested Dave off the camera against his will. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Podcast.